Amen. Almighty God, we thank you very much for tonight. Thank you for the important subject of prayer. And thank you because to our prayer answering God. We know you sit on the throne and you look down upon the earth. You look at all the vicissitudes of life that your children are going through. And you have told us that if only we can pray, that you are able to solve all the problems. And we pray, O oh Lord, tonight, as we look at this subject of prayer, you inspire our faith. You increase our faith. You strengthen our faith. Lord, we are praying that you inspire us as praying people so that your dynamic power, supernatural power, spiritual power will be abundantly felt in the church in Jesus' name. Open our eyes of understanding. Help us to see what you have preserved for us in your word. Help us, Lord. There will be no barrier between us and your word tonight. But your word will have a free flow into every heart in Jesus' name. Make us giants in prayer, warriors in prayer. And through the prayer life and faith, that will not be denied. We pray, Lord, you'll make us to be strong overcomers in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Tonight, we come in our study to James chapter 5. If you look at James chapter 5, You'll find that from the first uh, verses there, verses 1 to 6 in particular, it talks about the pain and the pressure of oppression. We studied that already. As the wicked, wealthy people misused and defrauded the poor believers at that time. And then you'll find in the verses following, verses 7 through 11, that the Apostle James was calling upon the believers that, number one, although there is pain, now there must be patience. You know, whenever we have problems, we think that the problems will last almost all eternity and we become impatient. And so he directed them that they needed to manifest patience. In verse 7 it says, Be patient therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. And then in verse 8, it says, Be ye also patient. And then in verse 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. And then he continues to direct the people, like saw the people that they should be patient. Number one, then in the chapter, we have the pain. Number two, we have the patience. Number three, now we have the prayer. As you look at what we're looking at today, what we're studying today, you'll find that he's talking about prayer. In fact, there's a peculiar thing as you look at this passage. In James chapter 5, reading from verse 13, we're looking at it all through to verse 18. And as I read Mark 8 in your Bible, you have prayer in every verse. Either it says pray, or he prayed, or he's talking about prayer. Look at it from verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. That's the word. Is any Mary, let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray, that's the word again, pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer, that's the word, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. Pray, that's the word, pray one for another, that he may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer, the second time in that verse, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias, Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed. How did he pray? He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months in verse 18 and he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit and so you find in every verse that we're looking at today verses 13 through 18 you have the mention of prayer if you count how many times that word appears it appears seven times in the passage 
And prayer is actually the climax of the response of the believer to oppression, to injustice, to persecution, to suffering, and to weakness. As you look at the whole Bible itself, you find that prayer is very, very important. As you look at the various forms, either pray or prayers or prayed or praying or prayer or prayers, you find that all those words connected with prayer, they appear 574 times in the Bible. And then actual prayers recorded in the Bible, you have 221. Which means then, it's very, very important. And what we're coming to today is a very profitable personal study. As you look at the teaching of the scripture, you find that individuals prayed. Groups of people prayed. Congregations prayed. And they prayed with great effect and great result. It is then your privilege, as it is the privilege of every one of us, that we'll learn about prayer, and the Lord himself will direct our hearts, and our prayers will become more effective, and our lives will become more useful in the kingdom of God, in Jesus' name. There are three points we're looking at. Number one is the exhortation. Number two is uh, the expectation. And then, number three, the example. Number one, exhortation to persevering prayer. Not snap short prayer. Not hitch and run prayer. Persevering prayer. That's the kind that works. That's the kind that uh, knocks at the gate of heaven and the windows of heaven are open and results come down. Number two, expectation of answers to prayer. That is when you pray. You are not just praying to be praying, just to fulfill all righteousness for praying's sake. You are praying so that you'll get an answer from above. Number three, example of persevering or prevailing prayer. Let's come back to number one. In number one, we're talking about the exhortation. That is the commandment. That is, we're told we must pray. We have a responsibility and a duty to pray. Look at verse 13 again. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. You know that uh, the writer has been talking about affliction. Actually, you remember, he talks about it in chapter 1, verse 2. He says, there are diverse temptations. That means different forms and kinds of trials. And then in chapter 1, verse 12, it says, we should endure temptation. And it says, we'll be tried, we'll be tested. And those trials, they spell out trouble, tribulation, difficulty, conflict, problems in our lives. And then he tells us in chapter 2, verse 5, there's a problem of poverty. And then as you go all through to verse 6, there is uh, injustice against the people of God. The question then is, as uh, children of God, as believers in Christ, as we go through life, and you see all those problems, all those conflicts, and you see all the things that we face, what's a believer to do? When he suffers any form of affliction, in that verse 13 which we read now, it says, Let him pray. We are commanded then to pray. What does that mean? Pour out your heart before God in prayer. What does that mean? Make your pain, your problem, your predicament, make it known unto God by talking to God. And what does that mean? It means you cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. It means you lean upon the everlasting arms. You come to claim the promises of the Lord and you stand on the promises of the Lord in prayer. Prayer then is a mighty weapon in the life of the afflicted believer or in the life of a suffering church. You see the commandment there? And you see what he's telling us to do. Look at uh, verse uh, 14. The latter part of verse 13 is sending Mary. Why is she Mary? His prayer is answered. His miracle has come. And because heaven has responded to his prayer favorably, now he's merry, now he's joyful. When he's joyful, when he's happy because of answered prayer, what you see to do? Let him sing psalms that is praising the Lord. That means then prayer and praise are joined together. First, you pray because of the problem. You're pouring out your heart. 
And then as the answer comes, you follow that, you accompany the prayer by praises unto the Lord. Then in verse 14, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He is still giving us the exhortation to persevere in prayer. In uh, Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 33, is, uh, is now telling us uh, in this Second Chronicles chapter 33, the exhortation we are following through as to when you get in trouble, when you get in a problem, when things are upside down in your life, what you are commanded or to enjoy to do in Second Chronicles 33, verses 12 and 13. Here it says, very clearly commanding us, and when he was in affliction, talking about Manasseh, he besought the Lord his God. He cried unto the Lord his God. He poured out his very pain. He poured out his heart unto the Lord. He besought the Lord his God. And he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And he prayed unto him. And he was entreated. That means the Lord answered him. And he heard his supplication. And he brought him again to Jerusalem. Into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. When God answers your prayer tonight, you will know that the Lord is God. Your neighbors will know that the Lord is God. Your enemies will know that the Lord is God. And then in Psalm 18. In Psalm 18, looking at it there from verse 6. Psalm 18, verse 6. Here the word of God tells us very clearly as well as pointedly. He says, in my distress, here is David giving us a testimony. And it is what others have been told to do. What everyone is told to do. David said, I did it. It brought result. I did it. I got the attention of heaven. I did it. And my problems were solved. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him even into his ears. In Psalm 50, verse 15. Psalm 50, reading there in verse 15. Still, we're following through on this commission that we have, this exhortation that we have, that we are to pray. Call upon me in the day of trouble. You don't turn elter skelter in the day of trouble. Don't just be weeping without uh, an end in the day of trouble. Don't, don't give up. Don't get discouraged in the day of trouble. There is a God in heaven that answers prayer. There is a God in heaven that takes our problems away. There is a God in heaven that said, if we call upon him, he will show us great and mighty things that we never knew. Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee. Amen. And thou shalt glorify me. But then you know that we're not only told to pray. We're told that we're to sing. We're to praise the name of of the Lord. If you have been praying, maybe it is time for you to start praising the Lord, rejoicing before the Lord, thanking Him because you know He will not fail. Praising His name because you know He sits on the throne in heaven and is uh, looking at the uh, children of men and He answers prayer. In First Chronicles chapter 16. First Chronicles chapter 16 reading from verse 8. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. When he answers your prayer, give a testimony. Make known his miracle. Make known that answer. Make known uh, the, the prodigies, the, the exploits, the great things that he has done. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous words. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the earth, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. And then it says, seek the Lord and his strength and seek his face continually. Then it says, remember his marvelous words that he has done and his, his wonders and is the judgment of his mouth. 
You understand then what the Lord is telling us to do? You understand the sin? You have a problem? You have an affliction? You have a sickness? You have a conflict? You have a family? A sin that is bothering you and overloading you? Pray. Talk to the Lord in prayer. He can solve the problem. There is no mountain beyond his power. And then, when he answers, is any merry, let him sing, singing psalms unto the Lord. But then he tells us, is anyone sick among you? What does that mean? He's telling us that there are times when the affliction caused by persecution, caused by oppression, caused by pressure, caused by injustice, may result in sickness. Or the sickness may just be part of our share of living in a sinful, cursed world. What are we to do when there is persistent sickness? What are we to do when we ourselves, we have prayed and the sickness has not gone? We have taken all the precautions necessary. We have taken all the cares necessary. And we have prayed, maybe we have even fasted ourselves. But the sin has not been taken away. It says, that's not the end of the road. Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him. Then it says, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's what we are commanded to do. We are to call on others that are leaders over us. When it says elders, what does that mean? It means maybe the pastor in the church, maybe the leader in the local church, because as you look at the New Testament, you find the people that are referred to you as the elders. Please turn your Bible to Acts, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 23. It says, and when they had ordained them elders in every church, and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they had believed. It says, they ordained them, they appointed them elders in every church. In every church you have the people that are preaching, the people that are leading, the people that are officiating. Those are the elders in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Verse 5, still giving us light, instruction, giving us understanding on those who are referred to as elders. It says in Titus 1 verse 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting there, listen to this now, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. And the elders are various, at various levels. Some of the elders are just simply local leaders in the church. Some of them will be just pastors in the church. Some of them might even be like apostles in First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, reading from verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, whom I am also an elder and a witness of the suffering of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here Peter himself, he was referring to himself as an elder. You know he was an apostle. You know he was also like an evangelist. You know that he was like a pastor and yet he said, I'm an elder too. So when James says in James chapter 5 verse 14, he said, seek among you, let him call for the elders of the church. You understand what it means now? The leaders of your own church. Not leaders in another church. Not elders in another church. But the leaders, the elders in your own church, then they will pray for you. And if they pray, the Bible gives us assurance, the Lord will answer. Will he answer? I said, will he answer? He has always answered, and he will continue to answer in Jesus' name. Now you find that it refers to the oil. That's what some people major on today. And because they major on it, they feel that God cannot answer any prayer at all, except there is uh, oil. But let us understand, you know, sometimes because they go to that extreme, we may come to this other extreme and feel that there is no place for it anytime at all. In Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6, verse 13. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. It says they anointed them with oil and they, they, they healed them. 
Why don't we carry bottles of oil about them? The reason is because this happened before the Acts of the Apostles. Before the Holy Ghost came in his fullness. And when the Holy Ghost came in his fullness, in the Acts of the Apostles, they understood the power, the authority in the name of Jesus. Remember Acts chapter 3, silver and gold have I known in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There was no oil, there was no anointed cloth, and the man rose up, and he walked. Do you remember Acts chapter 5? When they saw that Peter was there, as he was passing by, they brought all the sick people on the street, so that the shadow of Peter might just come upon them. And on whosoever that shadow came, then they were healed and delivered. There was no oil. Do you remember Acts chapter 8? That Philip went into Samaria, and they were told he preached Christ unto them. And they were told that many saw signs and wonders miracles were done because evil spirits crying out with loud voice they came out there was no oil there acts chapter 9 Docas had died and then peter was called he went in there and he prayed and Docas rose up there was no oil there and you remember acts chapter 19 it was not even a oil then we're told that paul the apostle many many miracles were done because they took aprons from the body of paul to Lay it upon the people having familiar spirit, evil spirit, and the evil spirit went out of them. Do you remember Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28? He had been in that uh, area, and then Publius uh, was sick. He prayed for him. There was no oil there, and he brought all the people from that place, and he prayed for them, and they were all healed. That's the reason we don't carry bottles of oil about today. Oil or no oil, when we pray for you, you will get well in Jesus. Jesus name even sometimes when the Holy Ghost is allowed to move, a little handshake can even give you that dynamic healing. An handkerchief upon you anointed can bring that healing upon you. Or just the shadow of an apostle getting over you, that can give you that uh, healing to you. Or just simply the name of Jesus because he has given us his name and he said, everyone that believes in me, the works I do, he shall do also. Why? Because anything you ask in my name that I will do in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse, uh, verse, uh, verse 17. And this sign shall follow them that believe. Do you believe? I said, do you believe? In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And they shall take off serpents. If they drink any deadly sin, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick. No oil here. No oil here. It's not every time you carry oil about. When there is oil, all right. If we want to use it, all right. If the Spirit of the Lord leads us, all right. But don't get bogged down. Don't get tied down to that. It's not every time you use oil. It says they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And if you have any sickness and infirmity tonight, you will recover as we pray together in Jesus' name. We come now to point number two, expectation of answers to prayer. Expectation of answers to prayer. Actually, this is an encouragement. For everyone that prays, this is an encouragement for anyone that has a prayer made on his behalf that God will answer. In James chapter 5, verses 16, verses 15 and 16, and the prayer of faith shall save the seed, and the Lord shall raise him up. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another. And pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Tell me out loud. Availeth much. That's the encouragement we have. If you pray, God will answer. If we pray for you, God will answer. If the whole church prays, God will answer. I want you to see here the passage is talking about prayer. Number one, it tells the individual to pray. That's in verse 13. He's sending among you uh, afflicted. Let him pray. Number two. He tells the elders of the church to pray. In verse 14. It says let, them, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray. Pray over him. Now he tells the whole church, the whole congregation to pray. In verse 16. Confess your faults one to another. Pray one for another another. You understand then, prayer should become a specialty 
for every member of the church, a specialty for every leader in the church, and a special thing for the whole church, that when we come together and we pray like this, heaven will notice that we are praying. And tonight, heaven will notice that you are praying in Jesus' name. But then he tells us, it says, it's the prayer of faith, in verse 15, that shall save the sick. The prayer of faith. Faith is very important when we pray unto the Lord. In James chapter 1, the first part of verse 6, it says, Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. As you come to the Lord in prayer, and as you pray even in your own house, as you pray anytime there is privilege, opportunity to pray, understand it's not how long the prayer is alone. It's not how loud the prayer is, not that alone, but faith. Because it says the prayer of faith shall save and heal and deliver the sick. In Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, reading from verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, He says, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hands and to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now, you see, it says, if you have faith, if faith is so important, how essential for you, my brother, my sister, how essential for me to you to develop faith. If faith is so important, think about other things to develop in your life. Think about other things to concentrate about in your life. And those things are not half as important, one-tenth as important as faith. Because if you have faith, just as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, any mountain, maybe in your life, maybe in your family, maybe on your children, anywhere, maybe in your local church, you will say to this mountain, remove to yonder place. And Jesus said, with that faith, with that faith, it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Why don't you take it as a challenge then? That as days go by, you will increase your faith, you will challenge your own faith, you will improve on your faith, and you will develop your faith. In uh, Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21, verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this that is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say, you always say, it, and it's a word of faith. You, you don't say word of unbelief. I will never get well. I'm always sick. It was on my daddy. It's now come on me. Mommy so, suffered it. I'm now. So, that's not word of faith. That's not what to say. You speak with faith. You speak in the name of Christ. You say to this mountain, you will not crush me. You say to this mountain, you will not remain there. You say to this mountain, you will not remain in my life. And if you have faith, ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. And then, tell me the last part of that verse, It shall be done. And then in verse 22, now all things, Whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, doubting, in prayer, wavering, in prayer, wondering, no, in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. And it says all things, and it doesn't matter what it is. If you will ask in faith, then the Lord will do it. But there's something here now. Uh, there is a clause here in James chapter 5 that many, many people overlook. And that's why many, many people pray and pray and pray. And in fact, even fast and fast for many, many days or even weeks. And the answers do not come. Come back to James chapter 5, reading from verse uh, 15. The latter part of verse 15. If he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And then it says in verse 16, confess your faults one to another, and then pray one for another. You see, sin is a barrier to answered prayer. If we really want the Lord to answer our prayer, then we must really believe the Lord. Look at Psalm 66. 
in Psalm 66. This is a familiar verse to everybody, but we should be doers of the word and not hearers only. Because if anybody be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he deceiveth himself. In Psalm 66, verse 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not do what? Will not hear me. That means then, if there is sin. That means if there is something that is wrong, you know that that sin is a barrier between you and the answer that you are asking for. And as you see that that barrier is there, you take the barrier out of the way. How do you take the barrier out of the way? Two ways. Number one, there is a barrier between you and God. Because when sin comes in, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. There is a barrier between you and your fellow brother. There is a conflict, or there is malice, or there is a kind of disagreement, or there is sin, unsettled sin, unconfessed sin, between you and your brother, you hurt him, or you hurt her, and you have not made right your way. The barrier with God, or between you and God, you remove by repentance. But the barrier between you and your fellow brother, or your fellow sister, you remove with restitution. Let me show you. That's very important when we talk about prayer. That's very important when you're expecting a miracle. That's very important when you believe that this thing you are asking for is very important and you want the Lord to give it unto you. In, a, in a Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. I'm reading some verses there. I'll start from verse 7. It says, Now, therefore, restore the man his wife. For he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. Here we have a man that took another man's wife. And then he was sick already. I'll show that to you as we read the last part, uh, second to the last verse of uh, the chapter. He was sick already with members of his family. And now God said, I know you, you did this in ignorance, in the innocency of your mind. But then there's something to do. You will restore the man, his wife, and then he will pray for you. Look at verse 14. It says, And Abimelech took sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and women servants, and gave them unto Abraham, and restored him Sarah, his wife. That was a barrier between him and the prayer to be answered. That was a barrier between him and the mountain that ought to be removed. Now he had made the restitution. Look at verse 17. So Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maid servants, and they bear children for the Lord at first closed up all the wounds of uh, the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. You understand then that if you are praying, but there's something you've done against your brother, against your sister, or against your local church, or against the central church, then you will make a restitution. And as you make the restitution, it will make your prayers to be answered very quickly. Please turn to Numbers chapter 12. In Numbers chapter 12, it says, And Miriam and Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. And they said, As the Lord in this spoken only by Moses, and as, as he not spoken by us, and the Lord heard it. Do you know every word you speak against your brother, against your sister, against your husband, against your wife, against your parents, or against your fellow brother, or against the leaders and the church, the Lord hears. And it may be for that reason you have some unsolved problems, unresolved issues in your life. And then eventually, look at verse 9. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them. And he departed, and the cloud departed from up the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam, and behold, she was leprous. 
And then now prayer was uh, to be made. Look at verse 11. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee, lay not the sin upon us, wherein we have done foolishly, and wherein we have sinned. And then in verse 13, it says, And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. Something surprising in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had put speech in her face, shall she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shot out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. You say, why was the healing delayed seven days? In fact, Miriam had to be shot out seven days. Well, do you notice there that she didn't confess? Do you notice there that Miriam didn't open her mouth to talk? Did you notice there that Miriam did not manifest humility to say, Moses, I know you are my junior brother. I know I've been of help to you when you are very, very young. And that has made me to be proud towards you. But now I realize I've sinned. I realize I've done something I shouldn't have done. Please forgive me. Maybe she would have been healed immediately. It was only Aaron that confessed. That's the reason why James is telling us, you want power in prayer. You want authority in prayer. You want the ability to remove mountain. And you want uh, your cloud to be taken away. You want your depression to be taken away. You want the mountains to be moved away. Confess your faults one to another. You have offended somebody. Confess unto them. Make restitution. Make things right in your life. That's why we're reading now in Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24 in verse 16. It says, and herein... Do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God? That's, uh, that's repentance. Toward God, you go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I've done what I shouldn't have done. I've gone against your commandment. I've trespassed and it isn't right. I shouldn't have done that. You have a conscience then void of offense toward God. That's not the end. There is still the part remaining. There is still an important side of the issue. It says that you have a, a conscience to void of offense towards men. That's restitution. You come to the Lord and then you say, Lord, I am sorry. And then you come to your fellow brother, your fellow sister, or may even be a sinner, a person that doesn't know the Lord at all, but you offended him, you stole something from him, you took something from him, and then you make your restitution. It may be in the church against the leader, against uh, the members of the church, against the workers, or against the whole church. You make your restitution. In First John, First John chapter 3, and verse 21 and verse 22. First John chapter 3, verse 21, verse 22. Beloved, if our hearts condemn us not, we have confidence toward God. If your heart condemn you, you'll not be able to manifest dynamic faith, strong faith, unwavering faith, great faith, that, that, that kind of faith that will not be denied. You'll be wavering. There will be doubt in your mind. The devil will be breaking it in your heart and you'll be having condemnation. It is when you have repented before God and you have made your restitution before your fellow brother, before your fellow sister, then your heart will not condemn you again. And beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. Verse 22, and whatsoever we ask, repentance that's taken care of, restitution that's taken care of. After that, you are bold. Because the righteous is as bold as a lion. Then it says, and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. And we do those things that are right and pleasing in his sight. I want you to then examine yourself. And see what uh, may be hindering your prayer. We come back to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The latter part of verse 16. It says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A righteous man is awesome. Is powerful in prayer. Think of Abraham praying as a righteous man. And see Moses as he prayed for Israel. And see, look at, uh, look at Samuel 
praying with immediate thunderous response coming from heaven. Have you read about Elijah when he prayed and fire descended? Have you read about Daniel when he prayed and swift answer came from heaven? Look at the apostles when they prayed and watch how diverse different miracles happen. That's what the Bible is saying that if your sins are cleansed away, if you are a child of God, if you totally rely upon the Lord, it says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That means righteousness, holiness, injects irresistible power to your prayer. God hates sin, but he loves righteousness. If you want to see more prayers answered, if you want to see total uh, devastation, demolition of the stronghold of the devil, what you have to do is to make sure that you examine your heart, you examine your life, and the blood of Jesus cleanses you and washes you whiter than snow, and then you come with boldness and courage before the throne of grace, and you stand upon the promise of God, and you claim that thing. If you do that tonight, it will be given unto you in Jesus' name. Because faith and righteousness, they make prayer dynamic and powerful. We come to point number three. Example of prevailing prayer. Example of prevailing prayer. In verses 13 and 14, he gives us exhortation. And in verses 15 and 16, he gives us expectation as well as encouragement that prayer will be answered. And so that you will not have any doubt in you, he now comes and is talking about Elijah. Elijah. And he gives us now an example of somebody that prayed and the prayer was effectual. The prayer was effective. Elijah, Elias, was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And that was a true story because Jesus Christ himself referred to that uh, account in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 25. See the reference of the Lord Jesus Christ to the account that uh, James is uh, referring to. In Luke chapter 4, verse 25, it says, But I tell you of the truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up, how many years? Three years and six months, when the great famine was throughout all the land. It's encouraging the elders that they are to pray. That if you're an elder, you're a leader, the Lord has appointed you the way the Lord appointed Elijah. And he sent him forth. And Elijah went with courage and with boldness. And any time he prayed, he prayed effectually. He says, that is the very same way you are to pray. When you pray for sick people in the, in the district. When you pray for sick people in the church. Elijah was a man of prayer. He had more power. He had more authority. He had more positive influence than the king Ahab on his throne because of his life and ministry of prayer. We too, we can have a more fulfilled and fruitful life if we will pray more. But there are some things to notice about the prayer of Elijah. If you are going to pray like Elijah, if you are going to actually have effect like Elijah prayed, you need to notice all this is because it's not just that, but I'm praying, but I'm waiting on the Lord, but I'm even joining fasting with it, and I don't know why my prayers are not as effective as the prayer of Elijah. Come to the Old Testament in First Kings chapter 18. First Kings chapter 18. Reading there in verse 36, the very first thing we notice about the prayer of Elijah. Uh, first Kings chapter 18, verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant. Listen to this now very important in prayer, that I have done all these things at 
thy word. You check up your life, everything you do during that prayer, everything you do in your life before that prayer, everything you do after that prayer, you do everything according to the word of the Lord. Not only that, number two. He prayed in line with the word of God. He prayed in line with the word of God. How did he pray? James tells us he prayed that it might not rain. And you find that in First Kings chapter 17 verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these days, but according to my word. That's what he prayed about, that there will be no rain, there will be no dew. All those three and a half years, could that be according to the word of God? How could Elijah be so sure that that was the will of God, that was the mind of God? In Deuteronomy chapter 11, Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses uh, 16 and 17. It says uh, in Deuteronomy 11, verse 16, Take heed to yourself, that your heart be not deceived, and ye turn aside, and serve other gods, and worship them. Then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, and in the land, nor yield, the land will not yield her fruit, lest she perish quickly from all the good land which the Lord giveth you. It says, if they offended the Lord, if they went away from the Lord, if they didn't do what they ought to do, then what could happen is that the Lord will stop the rain. Elijah knew that, and he prayed according to that word of the Lord. Number three, he prayed for the rain after purging Israel out of their idolatry and false worship. All the worshippers of Baal, he destroyed them. You, you examine your life, you check up your life. If there is any idolatry there, any false witness there, any false worship there, any strange fire there, any incense, all the things of the white garment people there, you burn everything, you throw everything away, and then you are ready for prayer. And then we are told, number four, he prayed earnestly persevering in prayer until the answer came and you see it in first kings chapter 18 you can read it yourself maybe you know the story already he sent out his servant go and see is, is there any response no go the second time and go the third time and go the fourth time until the seventh time you will find that he was persevering in prayer and then number five he prayed in faith how do we know he prayed in faith? Well, he announced the result even before the prayer. Look at uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. You will see how he announced the answer. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab. And I will send rain upon the land, upon the earth. And then he knew that uh, the answer was coming. Just like our choir sang to us now, that uh, the answer is on the way. And by the time you pray tonight, you'll find the answer is on the way in Jesus' name. And then in, uh, in the latter part of that uh, chapter, in First Kings chapter 18, verses 41 and 42. And Elijah said unto Ahab, get thee up. Eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. And I'm announcing to you tonight, there is an abundance of rain coming your way. An abundance of miracle coming your way. An abundance of healing coming your way. If you will believe the Lord, and you will pray with persevering faith, you will not be denied in Jesus' name. Before you go tonight, you are going to pray. I said you are going to pray. It's not the, the kind of prayer we'll be praying and we'll be sleeping. We will pray and even this place will shake in Jesus' name. I want you to put your finger in Mark chapter 11. Because I'm coming back to that. But look at Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. I am reading there from verse 31. And when they had prayed... The place was, tell me the next word, 
the place was shaking where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word with boldness. Now that's the kind of prayer the Lord wants you to pray so that all the mountains, all the strongholds, everything will be demolished in Jesus' name. Now in Mark chapter 11, Mark chapter 11 verse 22, Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say to this mountain, who are the people that want to say to that mountain? Who are the people that want to clear away the mountain? And you want the mountain in your life to move away tonight? The mountain that have been there for a long time, stronghold there every time, and the devil cheating us, not knowing that we are the children of the king, put your Bible down and stand up. And it, you will say, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt, and shall not doubt, and shall not doubt, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things that he says shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe, believe, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Tonight is the night of your miracle. Tonight is the night of your healing. Tonight is the night to take the mountain away. Tonight is the night for you to have a breakthrough. Tonight is the night that all those things the devil has put in your life, planted in your life. Tonight is the night that the Lord will take everything away. Every plant my heavenly father has not planted in your life. Tonight it will be taken away. Pray, open your mouth and talk to the Lord. I will not go back home with my sickness. I will not go back home with my problem. I will not go back home with my infirmity. I will not go back home with this mountain. Mountain, move out of my life in Jesus' name. It will be so. It will be so. That sickness will leave your body tonight. That mountain will leave your family tonight. If we have faith as a grain of mustard seed, we can say to this mountain, Mountain, be moved. Problem, get out of my life. Stronghold, be demolished tonight. All the oppression, all the affliction, all the attack, everything that the enemy has done in your life, the Lord can take everything away tonight. Speak to that mountain. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say it with me, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Say it again, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Say it out loud once again. It will avail in your life tonight. It will avail in your family tonight. I want you to raise up your hand and lay the other hand upon yourself. Remember the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. Avail that much. Whatever the devil is hiding in your life. Whatever sickness has been there in your life. Whatever infirmity has been there in your life. Whatever long-standing problem has been there in your life. Whatever yoke has been there in your life. Whatever cause has been there in your life. The Lord is taking it away tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Are you ready? I said, are you ready? How many of you believe that the mountain is going tonight? That the sickness is going tonight? That the infirmity is going tonight? That you will put the devil to shame in your life tonight? 
Amen. Put your, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because of the encouragement you have given us. The exhortation you have given us. The examples you have given us. You have assured us that if we'll say to this mountain, in the life of that brother, in the life of that sister, in the life of that teenager, in the life of that boy, that girl, that that mountain will have to move away. And I command you, mountain of problem, get out in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, your children are looking up to you. They believe in you. They are wanting to fulfill your word. Anything you tell them to do, by your grace, they will do it in Jesus' name. You devil, you have no right to be there in the life of the children of God. You sickness, you have no right to be there in the lives of the children of God. Barrenness, you have no right to be there in the family of the people of God. All your problems and conflict, you have no right to be there in the lives of the children of God. I command that sickness. I command that infirmity. I command that deformity. I command that pain in your body. I command that long standing terminal problem. Come out in Jesus' name. Oh Lord, all the sicknesses they have been going to the hospital. And it appears now, children of God, children of God, the people that have been healed by the stripes of the Lamb. And we couldn't claim our inheritance. And here we are there today, and we are there tomorrow. It will not be so again, in Jesus' name. That long-standing sickness, that long-standing infirmity, that long-standing yoke, that cause and that evil sin in your life, I command right now, come out in Jesus' name. Lord, I sprinkle the blood of Jesus upon all my brothers, upon all my sisters, all these young people, all these children. Oh Lord, I pray you break the yoke in their lives in Jesus' name. Where there is poverty, let prosperity come. Where there is suffering, take it away in Jesus' name. All the things that the devil has planted in their lives, every plant that the devil, the father, has not planted in every life, in every family, or put it tonight in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for every brother here, every sister here, it's a day of miracle. It's a study of miracle. It's an experience of miracle. Give it to everyone in Jesus' name. Break the yoke in every life. Destroy the works of the devil in every life. Heal every sickness in their lives. Give children to the barren, O Lord. I pray that as a result of what we've done tonight, there will be testimony in every mouth. There will be miracle in everyone. And the goodness of the Lord will follow them in Jesus' name. Deliver your people, O Lord. Release them from every affliction, every attack. Thank you, Lord, because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Amen. You have got it. I said you have got it. You go home rejoicing because the devil is defeated in your life in Jesus' name.